We ended last two weeks ago on our last journey into 1 Thessalonians. We finished chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And it was fun. That's the night I did a lot of shouting. Um, verse 13, 14, 15, and 16 say, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them, also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Now I put a note there, we are those who believe that Jesus died and rose again. Which he put for, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's us. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Meaning primarily we shall not hold them back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God the dead in Christ shall rise first note Jesus will command the seeds of the decaying dead bodies of the saints to break forth in the harvest of resurrected bodies I'm saying all this these are my comments I'm saying them because Jesus said that it must fall into the ground and die before it can bring forth talking about the harvest and then talking about the harvest of those dead in Christ. So when we bury them, God plants them. And then when Jesus descends with a shout of command, wherever those cremated ashes are, wherever those buried bodies are, if they've returned to complete sand, dust, whatever, wherever they are, God spoke everything into existence out of no thing or nothing so he's gonna have no business finding your remains now we won't have to look for lens because lens only gonna die one day before the rapture so uh, he'll be pretty much all together yet but uh, a lot of people have died in Christ um, since the early days of the Apostles and uh, their bodies are in total disarray, probably dust or dirt. But um, no problem for God. He's going to descend with a shout. He looks at their dead bodies as seed. And he's going to command the seed to break forth and harvest. And out of the area where they were buried, or their ashes were scattered, is going to burst a brand new body and God's going to catch that dead, lifeless body up. And the dead, the real saints that have died are returning with them. And they're going to enter into their new houses in a moment, in an instant. Bam! And then we'll be done watching. And we which are alive, in verse 16... No, verse 17, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I got crazy last time, and I said, what do you think he was shouting? And I gave you some examples. I won't get so Pentecostal this week. Um, save my energy for this week's lesson. But uh, got beside myself a little. Just think, when the resurrected bodies get up there where the dead saints are, right before the dead saint moves in his new body, you could say he's beside himself. Just had a thought. Just had a thought. Amen. So, we shall make our trip. I'm sure... It'll all happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The other, another passage tells us and um, so in 1 Corinthians. So uh, we're not going to really be viewing it. We which are alive and remain, they're going to be caught up and then we follow them right up. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now remember there are no chapter divisions in the original writing or verse division. Paul just went right on and wrote. 
the three verses we're going to talk about tonight. This week's lesson is called Peace and Safety. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3, right after he said, Wherefore comfort one another with these words, he said, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. So he's saying, you Thessalonian brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to times and seasons, I don't need to write anything on to you. The easy to read version puts it this way. Now, brothers and sisters, we don't need to write to you about times and dates. That's a little more probably the way we'd say it today. We don't have to write to you about what time this is going to happen, what time that's going to happen, what date. Now, Vincent, a Greek scholar, writes this comment. You notice in the King James it said, times, plural, seasons, plural. In the easy to read version, times, plural, dates, plural. So, Vincent writes, concerning the times and the seasons, he writes this. The plural is used because Paul is thinking of a number of incidents attending the preparation and the accomplishment of the second event and occurring at different times. So there's not just going to be a time and a season. There's going to be a lot happening for a very long time, not just seven years, a very long time. There's going to be a lot of things that play into what Paul has in mind, and we're going to talk some about them. And I'll guarantee you the list I come up with is nowhere near complete. Uh, there's going to be a lot of events. And um, all those things are part of the times and seasons. So he said, we don't have to write to you about these things. So putting it in context with last week's lesson, why is Paul writing verse 1 to his readers when he says, but of the times and seasons... Brethren, we have, uh, you have no need that I write unto you. Putting it in context, chapter 4, verse 13, he didn't want them to be ignorant about the dead in Christ. In verse 14 of the last chapter, the dead in Christ will return with Jesus. Verses 15 and 16, their bodies will rise first and then be joined with the dead in Christ who are returning with Jesus. In other words, the eternal you is coming back if you're dead. And you're getting a new home coming out of where your old home was planted. And then in verse 17 of chapter 4, Then the living saints will be caught up together with them in the clouds, so all believers can be with the Lord forever. Now, so he's saying, after he says all that in the review section, he says, but when it comes to specific times and seasons, you don't need that I write unto you. And he completes that thought in verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Wouldn't it be great if a thief would alert to you the exact date and time he was going to come and rob you? Maybe you could have an officer waiting there with you. Uh, but a thief tends to want to come when you're not expecting him. And that's what uh, the Bible compares the return of Jesus to. A thief in the night. All right? In other words, simply meaning he'll come when you're not expecting it. Okay. So, let me look at some other verses that tell a similar thing. Acts chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. Luke wrote uh, Acts chapter 1, and it kind of followed up his gospel of Luke. Kind of took off in Acts chapter 1, right where he left off in Luke 24, the ascension of Jesus Christ. So, in verse 6 of chapter 1, he said, When they therefore will come together, Luke is writing, about a time when Jesus talked to those disciples. He said, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? 
And he, Jesus, said unto them, his disciples, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. We have the same words that we have in our verse up here in chapter, uh, verse 1. Times and season. It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. But he went on to say in verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So what's he doing there? Jesus is saying to his disciples, don't worry when all this is going to play out because I got stuff for you to do. And I'm going to empower you to do it. The third person of the divine trinity is going to be moving in. Your body, your physical body, your house is going to get a little more crowded because now it's just not you living in there. Now you got God living in there with you. So he said, don't worry, God knows when all this is going to play out. Here's what you need to worry about. I'm going to fill you with my power and strength so you can go out and do what I want you to do. And the message would be the same today. It's wonderful to get caught up with Bible prophecy. But we don't know the day and the hour. And it's wonderful, and I'll get to that. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging on that thought. There is some things we can know. But for right now, before we get to that, we can't know the day and the hour. That God the Father reserved for himself. So know that he's coming again. And then as you wait for that day, work for him. Be filled with his Holy Spirit and go out and work for him. There was a saying I heard from a preacher one time, live every day like he's uh, work coming that night. But then there was some other side of that where, uh, but you play it out in your plans like he's not, you know. You uh, go about making your plans. Uh, churches have plans how they can reach out to this group or that group. Uh, evangelists have plans. Billy Graham had plans what towns to go to. So Billy Graham certainly believed, I'm sure, Jesus was coming in his lifetime, and he might yet, but his life is running out. He's in his 90s. And um, who knows? He, he could still be around, uh, uh, um, alive. You know, Lynn's got this thing, the rapture, it's going to happen the day after he dies, because he's a little cynical. But I can be even more cynical. I think the rapture is going to happen the day after I win the lottery. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm finally rich. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you know what? There isn't a thing in this world you will miss. I'd rather go to heaven than stay here and count my millions. I guarantee you that. Because millions in heaven is nothing. Amen? Yeah. All right, so he said, you know that he's going to come as a thief. So I added in there Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. Now in Matthew 24, where Jesus talks extensively about the last days, in verse 36, Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now that Jesus has ascended, it isn't that Jesus, you know, I love the way some of the commentaries talk. It isn't that Jesus couldn't have known, because he's God. But rather it's that he could not know. The, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when Jesus, I want to say exousia, but that's one of the Greek words for uh, power. Uh, there's dunamis and exousia. In the New Testament, exousia, any man uh, being uh, in John 1, 12, as many as believe in me, to him he give power to be the sons of God. And exousia means the privilege or right. Like you're a U.S. citizen, you have certain privileges and rights. That's what the word power means when it's from the Greek word exousia. Dunamis is dynamite. 
That means miracle working power. It means all kinds of stuff. But um, I can't think of the word. Uh, do you recall which word I'm talking about in Ephesians chapter 2? Where Jesus willingly walks away from, he lays some of his godly powers aside to come to earth, become a baby, never quit being God, never lost his power. Rather, he chose not to utilize some of his powers so that he could experience being human. Now, what do I mean by chose not to? Do you notice everything he did, he did in the name of the Father? He's God. He doesn't need to do anything in the name of the Father. He's got the same power the Father has. He prayed to the Father and asked God to do things. Didn't need to do that. It's not that he couldn't do it himself, it's that he could not do it himself. He had the power to choose to do everything through the Father, all right? And that's what we're talking about here. He laid aside the privileges, some of the privileges of being Almighty God, which is do whatever you want to do. Uh, he laid some of those aside and submitted everything to the Father and did everything through faith in his Father, all right? So, again, Matthew 24, Jesus said, No man knows that day, not the angels, but my Father only. So the wording there lends us to believe that Jesus chose not to know. Now, when he ceased being human after the resurrection, 40 days later, ascending back to heaven, I'm assuming... You know all the trouble you can get in for, to, with assuming. But I'm assuming that he instantly knew again once he got back to heaven. Uh, could be wrong there. Not important one way or the other. But when he's talking, he said, the only one who knows right now is the Father. Now, I think he's making a point. I think the Holy Spirit would have known. But he's making a point. Only God knows. And he seems to be indicating at this time, though I am God, I don't know. And I don't know by choice. I just shut that part of my brain off or whatever. I don't know if God has a brain. Uh, whatever it is that makes him think. Okay. How many of you know there's a lot we don't know about God? The only thing human about God is Jesus. Uh, so comparing how God operates to how we operate would be pretty silly lives in a different dimension uh it's just uncanny but anyway jesus said no man knows that day and the hour now you know what i'm a man yeah lynn you're a man <laughs> so we don't know we simply don't know so when someone even though i believe after having read the book that he was very sincere when someone who is a scientist writes a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 88, he should have taken note here, God's not going to let him know. Amen. No matter how scientifically he studied the scripture, I don't think he was a kook. I read his book. He tried to be meticulously accurate. Uh, and all of his reasonings were great, except for one thing. No man knows the day or the hour. And he, he says, yeah, but I can know about when. To an extent. Pinning it down to 88 is a little more than knowing about when. So anyway, um, God, we have God's word on that, that we don't know that. Now, we do know this. What is verse 2 of our current study? Whatever I say of our current study, I always mean we're in 1 Thessalonians 5, so that's verse 2 of 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians 5. I say it that way in case one of these other passages has a verse 2 in it. But none of these particular uh, passages do. So, before I get into that, I want you to see something. Uh, after telling you, show, oh no, it's right after. What is verse 2 of our current study along with the passage from Matthew and Acts telling us? Jesus is definitely coming back to raise the dead bodies of the dead in Christ's saints and to catch up the living saints so that all of God's children will be with him forever. However, we don't know exactly when it will happen. No man does. And let me underline my point this way. 
The Apostle Paul is the one who wrote, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with him. Paul fully expected Jesus to return in his lifetime. And do you know how many other men and women over the centuries have fully expected Jesus to return in his life, uh, their lifetime? Now, Paul figured it out that it wasn't going to happen when he wrote uh, 2 Timothy because he knew he was about to die a martyr's death in Caesar's prison. So he come to realize, he said, I'm ready to be offered. Well, you can't be the we which are alive and remain if you're ready to die. So he went through the process. Most of the disciples seemed to think when Jesus ascended that his return would be rapid within years, not centuries. And it didn't work out that way. Why? Because no man knows the day nor the hour. Okay, so now dropping down back to Matthew 24, but now three verses prior to verse 36, verses 32, 3, and 4. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that the summer is nigh or near. Putting it in terms of you and me living around here. When you see the trees budding, you know leaves are right around the corner. Isn't it amazing when you start seeing those little buds on trees? Seems you come out, go to bed one night with buds, come out next day and it's full of leaves. It's a rapid thing. So he's using a scenario similar to that, saying, you know this much. When this happens, you know this uh, is coming. And uh, so when the buds, the trees start budding, summer's on the way. In our case, spring's on the way and summer will follow. All right, now, verse 33. So likewise you, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, so all these things be fulfilled. So, if we can't know the day or the hour, then why even talk about it? Because Jesus made it plain in Matthew 24 that we can know that it is near, even at the door, when we see Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Now, he, he's likening it to the fig tree. Now, what is he saying when you see these things being fulfilled? He's talking about everything he has been saying up to this point in Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a prophetic chapter of the gospel. When Jesus, the disciples, asked him, uh, you're going to set up your kingdom now? And so he went into some detailed things in Matthew 24. And now at this point in Matthew 24, he said, like the fig tree... You can know certain things. You can know when summer's coming by looking at the fig tree, and you can know when these things that I'm talking about are getting near. And that's when some of them begin getting fulfilled. All right? Flip your page over if you would. Verse 3 of chapter 5 in 1 Thessalonians. Is an important verse. For when they shall say, now let me read verse 2 again, because we had a lot of verses in between them. I want you to keep it with the text. Verse 2 said, For yourselves know perfectly. Again, verse, he's writing to Thessalonian Christian. Verse 1, he says, You don't need, need me to try to explain times and seasons to you. In verse 1, verse 2, because you know the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. Now verse 3, for when they shall say, peace and safety. Here's where I got my title for tonight's message. When they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. 
and they shall not escape. So, how many ever heard someone tell you, they say, and you always wonder, who are they? They talk a lot. Whoever they are, talk a lot, because people are always saying, they say. I think sometimes they ought to shut up, because they're always saying something. Well, here's Paul almost seemingly using that analogy, but he's not. He said, when they shall say, peace and safety, who are they? There's a note, who's, who will say peace and safety? Barnes has a note here that I wanted to share. That is, when the wicked shall say this. Now, how does Barnes know that he's, uh, Paul is referring to the wicked here? He said, the wicked shall say this, for the apostle here refers only to those on whom sudden destruction will come. So he's not talking, see how, see how it's worded here? When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Sudden destruction doesn't come upon you and me. So it isn't Christians who are saying this. It is non-believers. Barnes uses the word wicked. Uh, I'd use the word non-believer because there, there are a lot of unsaved people who aren't wicked. But uh, nonetheless, Barnes is getting out when they're the unsaved. He's, he's using wicked in the sense we're all sinners without Jesus. And in that sense, until Jesus comes in our lives, we're all wicked. But in the way... Um, you, every one of us in here know some unbelievers are pretty nice folk. And um, so I would use, if I were making, doing commentary in this chapter instead of saying the wicked, I would say unbelievers will say. So the, the they who will say peace and safety are the unbelievers. Now, I put up there, who will say peace and safety? Then I quoted Barnes, and then I have my answer down. I agree with Barnes that verse 3, certain, it, it certainly as all has, I meant to say has, not as, forgot the H there, has all unbelievers in mind. But I also wonder if it's an ongoing principle throughout the total process once it all begins. But before we go there, Please note the following. So we're going to go into 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 10 for a moment. And then I'm going to get back to that, that they shall say peace and safety being something that's going to happen throughout the process. And it's a long process. All right. Peter says in verse 3 of chapter 3, reading on to verse 10, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, this can't be the last days because no one scoffs at Christianity today. Everybody in America loves Christianity. There are no atheists. There are no skeptics. There are nobody who thinks we, of all people, are haters. We are revered by the rest of the citizenry here in America. I hope you know I'm being silly and sarcastic here. Um... He said, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, there have always been scoffers. So when a scripture says something there, there shall come, you shall know things by earthquakes and that. Well, we understand since earthquakes have always been there, that he's talking about an increase of earthquakes. And since there have always been scoffers, I would take this verse to mean to you and me, an increase in scoffers. And when it comes to America, wow. Those who scoff at Christianity in America today compared to when I was a teenager, thousands of times more. Unbelievable. I'm seeing things in America that a teenage me would have never thought he'd ever see in America. So, Peter said that there shall come in the last days scoffers. This is an important phrase here walking after their own lust. They're doing what they want. Is that happening in America? 
the scoffing at Christianity, calling us haters, walking after their own lust or desires. And again, the word lust doesn't mean good lust or bad lust by itself, but in the Bible, 90% of the time it's used in the New Testament, it talks about bad desires. All right? And it's pretty uh, easy to understand that's what it's talking about here, walking after their own evil desires. So he said, there will in the last days come scoffers, then in verse 4, and saying, what are these scoffers going to say? Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now remember when Peter's writing this, I'm sure like Paul, he has in the back of his mind, he's going to be alive when Jesus comes. So the scoffers of his day were saying, since the early preachers fell asleep, who told us all these prophecies, nothing's changed. Now to you and I, there have been 20 centuries since the fathers Christian, of the Christian faith told us these things. 20 centuries. All right? We're working on the 21st. Theoretically, when we get to 2130. Well, Jesus was 30, they say, when he died. So, and most think he was born somewhere around 3 to 5 B.C. So when we get to 21, 25, 6, or 7, we will have spent 21 centuries. 21. Well, that's 20. The first century uh, was, was then, so we will have spent 20 centuries, 2,000 years. No, we're in 2,100. It would be 2,100 years, no matter. Don't you love me doing the math in my head while I'm up here? Uh, it'll be 2,100 years. Yeah. What you want, Jake? But there will be a 2,000 before that. What's that? Right. No way it'll be two zero. That's right. So it'll be 20 centuries. 20 centuries. If you'd have brought a calculator, we could have done this easier. All right? So 2,000 years, somewhere along the line, we don't know exactly when Jesus died in the first century. He was 30 years old, so somewhere, depending on when he was born, in 27 or to 29, uh, or 25 to 27, and if, if uh, the scholars are right as to his birth. And so um, we're getting really close. This is 17, another 10 years, and we have had literally 2,000 years past. Remember, Jesus was the first one to talk about these coming things in Matthew 24. And so we re began receiving these prophecies out of the mouth of Jesus. So it'll be... Uh, 2,000 years here very soon. All right. So, he said, since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In today's America, if you would get up on a public stage and sing to unsaved people about Jesus coming again, they'd think you're crazy. What are you talking about Jesus coming again? If they're not from a church background, they think, what? Bard's brother one time when I was first married into her family, on Easter, I sat down and watched a movie about Jesus. And I'd have been about 20, 21. I don't know how quick it was after married. And her brother, who's unsaved, was sitting there watching it with me, and he'd heard about Jesus dying for it. He was astounded when the movie showed him come out of the tomb. He had never heard that Jesus rose again in America at a time when the gospel had a lot more respect than it has now. So I'll guarantee you that there are a lot of people out there that have all heard Jesus died for us and have all heard it twisted into that means we're all going to heaven, but have never heard that Jesus rose again or definitely that he's coming again. Well, most of them would, would have heard he's risen again because you, they'll see signs when they drive by churches. But I'll guarantee you there's a huge amount of them never have had heard the concept he's coming again. So they, they're meant, and if you told them, they'd say, what? 
Jesus was 2,000 years ago. He hadn't come back yet, has he? And uh, so then you go to verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old before Noah, and the earth, are in Noah's day, standing out of the water and in the water. Well, in creation and then in Noah's day again because of the flood. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perish. Well, that's Noah, definitely. All right. Now look at verse 7. But the heavens, this is something they're willingly ignorant of. Verse 7. The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. The way the world in Noah's day was kept safe until the day. All right. The world today that you and I live in, by the same keeping word of God, are kept in store right now. But why? Reserved under the fire, are reserved on the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter saying, folk are willingly ignorant of this. They don't want to think about judgment. So they crack jokes. Well, I want to go to hell where all my friends will be. Yeah. We'll party. Good luck with the partying down there. Um, it's interesting that Peter's writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says they are willingly ignorant. They choose to be ignorant on this. Is that amazing? They choose to be ignorant. So, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's saying... God's not taking his time just to take his time. From eternity past, he knows who's going to be in heaven, and he's not going to wrap this up till every one of them are there. Every last one of them, all right? So he is long-suffering to us word. All right? Not willing that any should perish. Verse 10 again, the same thought, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's what verse uh, 2 tells us in our study here. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And don't anybody worry. I, I, in my own particular theology, I believe that's when all mankind is standing before the white throne judgment seat of God, and he is redoing earth. You know, there's a store out by Walmart in Manawa, a grocery store there, that they closed down for a while to redo. And so now it's open again. God's going to close earth down and start over with it. He's going to refix it, and all the folk will be busy at the time anyway at the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of God Almighty at the great white throne judgment. All right, so what do we learn from the above passage, passage in 1 Peter? The total process God begins with the rapture lasts throughout the tribulation period, seven years or more. Remember, the rapture doesn't begin the tribulation period. The signing of a peace treaty does. So there could be some time between the rapture and the signing of that peace treaty. Not much, but some. So at least seven years. And then it'll last through the millennial period all the way to the great white throne judgment. So you're talking a minimum of 1,007 years this process is going to take. All right? So a minimum. Now, 
What do we learn from the above passage? The total process begins with those things. And so then I ask the question, what did I mean when I sit up here above? Um, what did I mean when I said that when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them might very well be an ongoing principle throughout the total process. I believe the world will be saying peace and safety before the rapture. If the trump of God sounds tomorrow afternoon at three, it'll be like a thief in the night. Even we won't know it's coming. But all the unsaved will be walking around saying peace and safety. If we can just get rid of Donald Trump, everything will be good again. Peace and safety. Everything's going to go good in America. We're going to build a utopia here. We'll get him and Peach, get one of our guys in sooner or later, and we can get back to building utopia. Peace and safety. No boundaries anywhere. Everybody can go anywhere they want throughout the world. Peace and safety. The rapture. Everybody's gone who, who believes. Every Christian gone. They'll be saying peace and safety. He'll come for his believers in a moment. I believe Israel will be saying peace and safety before they sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist, which starts the seven-year tribulation period. Now, why would Israel, living in the midst of all those Arab nations, ever say peace and safety? Because I believe that Ezekiel 38 and 9 happens first, and... Uh, Russia will attack with a coalition of Arab nations will attack Israel and God will destroy I forget the exact percentage it's it's uh, something like uh, seven eighths or two thirds huge percentage of everyone who attacks Israel not only on the battlefield but in their home countries so in other words a lot of Israel's current enemies will be wiped out when God judges them for attacking Israel. So now Israel, and the, and the false prophet is going to take credit for that by calling down fire himself to prove I'm the one that did this for you. And he's going to deceive them into signing a peace treaty. And so I believe that Israel is going to be lulled to sleep and fall into this process of saying peace and safety when they sign that peace treaty. And we know that won't work out for him. I believe the unregenerate of the tribulation period will be saying peace and safety before the two witnesses are resurrected and caught up to heaven. They're going to be partying in the street when those two witnesses are dead. We believe they're going to be showing it on international television. Everybody's going to be partying, those haters. Those people who hate everyone, those two witnesses, those two meanies, they're dead. The Antichrist was finally able to kill them. Yay! Peace and safety. Then, bam, they get up, are seen of everyone, and go up to heaven. I believe those who decide to revolt against Jesus at the end of the millennial period will be saying peace and safety before God defeats the devil for good and cast him into the lake of fire. Why do I believe that? Why does the devil keep going against Jesus? Because he's able to deceive himself. I can beat him this time. And he'll deceive all those multitudes. He'll be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And there'll be a whole bunch of people in the millennial reign who are being born who don't like the kingdom of God on earth. You and I will reign with him. Now listen to me. According to the scripture, with a rod of iron. Now why do we have to reign that way? Because these people being born aren't all being born again. So they're being born into a kingdom where you don't get to experiment with sin. You're being ruled with a rod of iron and you're not liking it at all. 
So the devil is loose at the end of that thousand year period and quickly makes his rounds and deceives a multitude. Not a handful, a multitude. And the very final ba battle of all scripture occurs. And God wipes out the rebellious and throws Satan into the wake of fire. The final battle. And I'm sure that those who are revolting have been deceived by the devil. And they think, finally, we'll get rid of this regime that is treating us this way and we can have some fun. Peace and safety. And in every case, those who cry peace and safety will find nothing but sudden destruction. Again, I want to point out Peter said that those who revolt are willingly ignorant. They don't want to do things the Bible's way, so they willingly determine that God meant something else. All right, Romans 1, 18 to 20 at the bottom. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. God's word rendition renders it this way. God's anger is revealed from heaven against every ungodly and moral thing people do as they try to suppress the truth by their immoral living. Now, why does it render it that way when it said that they, um, they try to... Uh, the ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth and right, righteous, unrighteousness. We think holding the truth means holding on to it. But the Greek word here doesn't mean that. According to Vincent, it means to hold down, hinder, or repress it. So what the scripture is saying in verse 18 here, the wrath of God is going to be revealed against ungodly people who try to repress, suppress, and hold back the truth of God through their immoral living. So when you're a college age kid, and you've got this handful of Christians over here telling you about Jesus, loves you, and you got all these other college kids telling you, let's go party and have fun tonight. Let's go to spring break and show off our bodies and do everything we want to do to everybody we want to do it with. Let's have a party. So you got this guy over here in a bow tie saying Jesus loves you. And you got all these other people say, yeah, he loves you. And he made you the way you are. And he wants you to live and have fun. They will suppress the truth with their adulterous living. Well, none of them are married in, that, in usually in those cases. They're fornication. They're lust. They will suppress the truth. And it'll sound good to these young gullible people who think since the fathers fell asleep, nothing's changed. Let's party. And so Paul writes something similar to what Peter wrote. He said, God is angry at those people who suppress the truth through their immoral living. What is happening in America today? The morality of the Bible is scoffed at. If you dare say in some kind of a public forum where people can hear you outside of the church that the only kind of sex that God thinks is all right, and color me stupid, I, I, I kind of think it's important what God thinks. And the only kind of sex that God thinks is all right is between a husband and a wife. No other heterosexual sex is okay. No other kind of sex of any kind is okay. The only kind God has said, I'm good with that. The marriage bed is on the file. No other is. Young people don't want to hear that today. And so there are people out there suppressing the truth, saying, God made you that way. Now, why would he make you that way if he didn't want you to live that way? Doesn't that make sense? That's what they're telling people. Don't listen to the haters. They're, they're like, they're, some people compare Christians in America to ISIS. Now, the last I knew, we weren't cutting anybody's heads off, crucifying anybody, killing anybody, blowing ourselves up to do harm to anybody. But they compare us to ISIS. 
because we are haters. We tell people, no, God doesn't want you doing that. No, that's not a real message. A real message is wherever you're at in life right now, come to Jesus. Amen. That's our message. But they know these people who are orchestrating all these movements in America today know what our doctrine is. Our doctrine is of the day of judgment. And because we believe God will judge those who don't live according to His standards and put their faith in Him, that we are haters. And so he said that people are holding down the truth through their unrighteous living. But look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God has showed it to them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, be understood, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Peter said they are willingly ignorant. Paul said God made it plain. They're denying simple truths, simple facts. They have no excuse. God doesn't care if somebody stands up and before the great white throne and says, well, I just thought that uh, that's not the way you thought. I, I thought that all this happened with a big bang. God said, you have no excuse. I made it plain to everybody. That's God's mentality on this. So what does Paul claim the ungodly are doing? They are willingly suppressing the truth of God as revealed in his word. They encourage people to drink of the cup of immorality so that they will stay drunk with the so-called pleasures of sin and not focus on what God has said. The last thing people who peddle immorality, the last thing, and that's what we're doing in America today, we're peddling immorality. God made you this way. You might look like a boy, but you're a woman inside. You know you are. God made you that way. You might be a boy, but you're like other boys instead of girls. God made you that way. You might be a man now, but you want to transgender. God gave you that desire. We are peddling immorality in America today as a drug. And people are getting high on it. And the idea of the peddlers is to keep them too high on immorality to ever give the teaching of Scripture another thought. That's what Peter and Paul are talking about. What does God think of their rebellion? He says they're without excuse. How does the end of verse 3 of our current study, or what does the end of verse 3 of our current study tell us will happen to those folks? Up here, verse 3 at the top of the page. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So what's the answer? What does it say will happen to those folk? They will become impregnated with and give birth to destruction. 